So you're probably better off not quite pushing those to failure. Once in a while, maybe go to failure on them. But if you do it all the time, you're going to overtrain pretty quickly. You're listening to the Ethos Athletes Podcast, where we believe that your health is the number one resource you need to accomplish your dreams. My name is Dr. Matthew Hernandez, and I'm a physician dedicated to helping my patients maintain their active lifestyle and continue doing what they love. I'm sitting down with other experts so that we can provide our listeners with the knowledge they need to improve their health and live their best life. Hey everyone, this is Dr. Matthew Hernandez and you're listening to the Ethos Athletes Podcast where we provide resources to help you live an active lifestyle. Today we're going to be continuing our strength training series uh, with special guest August Schmidt who is the owner of East Valley CrossFit, Iron Athlete Clinics, and then is also the president of the Arizona Weightlifting Federation. So August, welcome back to the show. Hi Dr. Matt, good to be back with you. For those of you who listened to episode one of our strength training series, we basically talked about some of the overview when it comes to strength training and the different goals that people have. Uh, so what what inspired us to create this particular series is people know that we're a proponent for strength training, but not everyone knows how to go about doing it. And so we wanted to go and talk about uh, how to properly strength train um, and you know do it safely, and then also kind of just break down the different goals you can have when you're strength training. So Episode one, we talked about the four goals being hypertrophy, muscle endurance, strength, and explosiveness. And we're going to be discussing each of these goals in separate episodes. And so today we're going to be focusing on hypertrophy. Uh, So August, can you tell us a little bit about what hypertrophy is? In the most basic terms, hypertrophy just refers to an increase in the size of a muscle. So you can hear it referred to as the cross-sectional size increase in in the muscle. Um, It's making the muscle cells larger. Okay. It's basically the body's response to stimulus or to stress. Um, When the body gets an appropriate dose of stress, it responds by adapting to become more efficient at dealing with that stress. Um, If you give it too big of a dose, it can be injury, illness, death, you know, something like that if it's an overwhelming dose. But if it's an appropriate dose that the body's capable of responding to, given time to recover, you should come back and be stronger and more capable over time as, as your body adjusts to the stimulus. Okay. Now, wh- when we're looking at uh, hypertrophy as a whole, why would some people want to train this? Like, wh- Why would some people make this their goal? What are some of the reasons for that? You can pursue hypertrophy for different reasons. Um, probably the most common is just going to be for appearances, for aesthetics. People want to look a certain way or uh, want to present a particular image. Okay. So you can train that way. That's probably the general population. That's probably most people training. Okay. Um, Then you have bodybuilders who are training for very specific purposes. They're trying to accomplish as much size, symmetry, um, all the details that go into bodybuilding as they can. Okay. And then you also have athletes in contact sports and in strength sports who can benefit from hypertrophy. Um, Hypertrophy can help with contact because it's going to give you more mass. You're bigger. Mm -hmm. Um, So, you know, you run two objects into each other. The bigger one is going to win usually. going to have some advantage. Yeah. (laughs) Um, You could do the train that way as protection, maybe trying to protect joints. Okay. um, Protect protect your body just because it has um, more muscle Mm -hmm. uh, encasing it. And then you could also use it with strength athletes in order to allow them to become stronger or to, to go up a weight class. Muscle size is correlated to strength. It's not one-to-one. It's not a direct one-to-one re- relationship. But typically, if you can make a muscle bigger, you should be able to get more strength out of it. Okay. Um, it's not a strict relationship, but it, it can be used to build the platform to increase strength. Okay. You've probably heard of German volume training. That's uh, something that's kind of out in the, in the common knowledge now of and that's an approach of doing 10 sets of 10. The, the story behind that or the um, myth behind it or whatever, the creation story behind it is that uh, the uh, German weightlifting team was using 10 sets of 10 in order to hypertrophy the legs of their athletes to either push them up into another weight class or to make it so that they had bigger legs that they could hopefully convert later into high, higher levels of strength. Mm-hmm. Um, that's very different than traditional weightlifting training. I've heard different theories that that came to – be involved in the German program through influence from uh, American bodybuilders. Like, you know, if they wanted to figure out how to make these athletes bigger, they would look to athletes who train for hypertrophy. Right. Um, Vince Garando was doing 
stuff similar to the 10 by 10. He would do eight by eight with very short recoveries. I don't know the exact details of the origin story there, but that's kind of, that's what I've gathered of it over the years. So then in general, hypertrophy is increasing size of the muscle and people that would in general be the ones training for this would be someone like a bodybuilder, someone who just wants to look jacked and more like aesthetically pleasing, I guess. Those would be one of the main groups. That group would probably pursue a little bit more of a um, pump type training okay, or um, what can be referred to as sarcoplasmic hypertrophy, which is an increase in the... Uh, muscle size due to more fluid in the cell. Okay. This is going to result from more of a metabolic type of training. Nice. Basically, that's referring to when you feel the burn. Okay. Like when you work a muscle to fatigue, feel the burn um, from all the byproducts created during the body's metabolizing energy. Okay. So there's sarcoplasmic hypertrophy, and then you have myofibril hypertrophy. And myofibril is going to be more associated with strength gains and um, it's not going to probably lead to as much increase in size. And it's more on the level of the uh, sliding filaments where you're increasing the protein and the myosin and actin so that uh, you can create a more forceful contraction. Okay. And this would probably be more in like a football player, the contact sport player, stuff like that. That's going to be strength athletes, um, Olympic weightlifting, powerlifting, things like that. Um, football, lots of different sports where, where you would want to, increased power output or ability to generate force. And particularly, you can go more and more towards that type of adaptation with athletes that you don't want to increase the size of. Okay. So you said with um, sarcoplasmic hypertrophy, that's more of a metabolic training. What what would the myofibril hypertrophy be more of? Is it more of like a... It's lower reps, a little longer recovery, more what you would think of as like more traditional strength training. Okay. So the sarcoplasmic is going to be more like what you'd probably think of as bodybuilding training where you're doing eight to 12 reps, um, sometimes more, um, maybe supersets or tri-sets where you're pairing two, maybe three exercises together. Okay. And you're keeping your recovery periods pretty short. Okay. Like 90 seconds or less and a lot of times less. Okay. Um, some of the stuff Vince Garano was doing was like the eight by eights. He was getting those rests down to like 10, 20 seconds. So you were just going through fast. Yeah. And, and that was to stimulate that hypertrophy. That's feeling the burn for sure. Yeah. yeah. And that's very <laughs> different than like an Olympic weightlifters training or even usually a powerlifters training, which is going to be much lower reps, five reps or less, um, and longer recoveries. Okay. So it's, it's, they look, the two types look very different. You can use them together. Um, you can use them as a periodized model where you're trying to accomplish different things at different times of the year. Mm. But those are the main differences between the two types. Now, obviously, there's going to be different answers depending on a number of different factors, which we'll we'll get into. But in in general, when we're looking at, uh, we're talking about hypertrophy being two different classifications. So one is muscle strength, the other one is muscle size. How long does it take to increase strength, or let's go with size in general, and then we can go with strength if, if it's not the same amount of time? Okay. Yeah, that's probably a question that a lot of people have and. Like most honest answers, it's going to say there's a lot of variables. It depends. It depends a lot. Um, It's going to depend on the athlete's training history. It's going to depend on their lifestyle. It's going to depend on their hormonal environment. Um, There's an immense amount of variables there. So it's it's not particularly fast. You can you're probably more likely to get sarcoplasmic or pump hypertrophy faster than you would strength hypertrophy. But neither one of them is going to happen particularly fast, and it's it's a very long process to build strength or to, you know, optimize or get to near limit of your body's ability to hypertrophy. Yeah. When you first start strength training, it's not uncommon to not see much change in your musculature for a month or two months, you know, time period where your body at that point is learning the movements. Okay. So your nervous system is learning how to efficiently do the movements. So you're laying down those neural pathways, you're increasing your strength because your body is becoming better at doing those movements. Okay. And it's probably capable of doing most of those with the existing levels of hypertrophy and strength that it has. As you get more proficient with the movements, you can tax the muscle more deeply, and then you're going to start to have an adaptation in the muscle where you're going to start hypertrophying along with the neural adaptations. Okay. But there's so many variables. Oh, absolutely. In what result people get from training. You can train two different people the exact same way and, and have results that are pretty different okay. um, depending on age and, and sex and everything else and training history, how they're taking care of themselves. So th- there are tons of variables in it. 
it's really more like you can kind of look at a certain situation and say, well, this would probably be what I'd expect from you mm-hmm. over this time period. But it's much harder to lay out a general, like, this is how it works for everybody. Okay. Yeah. And, and that makes, that makes complete sense. That's why, I mean, that's obviously where like unique programming comes in for each person and stuff like that. When you're looking at training for size versus training for strength, can you talk about, uh, let's focus on one and we can just go with size for now. What are some of the techniques and like, you know, I guess tactics, quote unquote, that you can use to, um, to go and actually uh, uh, train for size and, and help with that aspect of hypertrophy? It's challenging to set real clean boundaries on, well, this type of training, if you want to be this way and this type, if you want to be that way, because right. it's all on a continuum and, and there is some overlap. And you can also use different methods at different times in your training or different parts of your periodization program. It's not unusual to start with higher reps and hypertrophy earlier and then convert to strength and then power as you get more sports specific. Mm -hmm. Generally, to train for hypertrophy, kind of the standard recommendations are that 8 to 12 rep range, fairly short recoveries, maybe 90 seconds or less, doing multiple sets and then doing multiple sets for each body part or multiple exercises for each body part. That's kind of the standard approach to it, but then you can start implementing all different sorts of uh, methodologies to try and enhance that or to increase the stimulus. Um, Like we talked about last time, maybe pre-exhausting a muscle. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if you did your pec deck and then went to your chest press, so you pre-exhausted your pecs before you go into it or your pullover before doing your pull down. So you pre-exhausted it so you can, in theory, more deeply stimulate that muscle group and elicit more growth. Um, But for the foundational work of, of general size, your probably most productive energy or use of energy is going to be doing large multiple joint movements, squats, bench presses, shoulder presses, pull-ups, bent rows, deadlifts, those types of movements that are stimulating large portions of the musculature and that are eliciting a significant response systemically. So your whole body is being taxed while doing them and you're working large muscles and you're under larger loads. Okay. So that that would probably be the key early on to it. And then it's going to be, you're going to have to adjust over time because your body will respond to a lot of different things, but it won't respond to the same thing forever. Yeah, that makes sense. I'm sure as a coach, you're going and saying, okay, we need to change up different variables in that same exercise. Like, um, what, what would some examples of that be that, that you use? There's a lot of ways to create variation, you know, starting out with just even your weekly layout of your exercises, your exercise order in a particular workout, your set and rep scheme. You can manipulate your reps. You you can manipulate your rest. You can vary lots of different factors that go into it. Um, Even basic, like progressing your rep scheme. So maybe you start at eights and then go down to fives and then go down to threes. It's not a big change, but you are changing the stimulus and changing the demand. Okay. Um, and I'm, I'm assuming those different variations that, that you can manipulate, those are going to be for any, a, a given person, right? Like you'll, you'll make one change for this person, but different changes for the second person. It depends if you're training a team for a specific task on a specific date, mm-hmm. you can keep them on a more similar program. Okay. Whereas if you're doing individual training for two different people, then you need to take into account that specific person's details okay. and program accordingly because, yeah, you're going to get – they're going to have different objectives and they're going to have different starting points. If you're training a group or a team, you're hoping that you've kind of got them to a similar place mm-hmm. and then you have a similar endpoint, and so you can accomplish that with programming for, for that group. Okay. And you may just manipulate what you're doing throughout the year so they're not doing the same thing all year round. Okay. Maybe they're doing more upper body strength exercises with their gymnastics early in the year and then, you know, they transition – into doing more skill work with it. And then they, as they get close to the comp season, they transition into sports style training what, for whatever that sport is. Okay. Yeah, earlier you also mentioned like uh, a pump essentially as well. Uh, can you explain a little bit more about what that is and when you would use it in general? Um, well, getting a pump just means you're pumping blood into the muscle. Basically the arteries are pumping the blood in and then the veins get a little bit constricted by the pressure and you can't get as much blood out. So you trap blood in there. That pump, you know, makes your muscle look bigger. You, you, if you measure it, it's bigger. It feels kind of good. You know, people people like it. Arnold Schwarzenegger used to talk about it. Uh, you've seen that in his Pumping Iron, if uh, if you've watched that movie. Yeah. Also, research is being done now on occlusion training, where okay. it's basically 
putting like a tourniquet around the body part. Yeah. And then with light weights pumping. And so it's getting all the blood pumped in, but it's not getting it out. And that's leading to pretty significant responses of hypertrophy in those mu localized muscles. And that's kind of spurring some research as to why is this happening? Is this because there's um, signaling going on from the byproducts of the contraction? Are hormones being drawn in and held in this area? Is it because the increased blood flow? What is it that's causing this hypertrophy? Mm -hmm. Because the, you can create hypertrophy with very low weights when you're using the occlusion training. So okay. it kind of is if something's changing and it's showing us that there's some other factor in hypertrophy. Yeah. And I, I've actually seen that used and uh, there's a few physical therapists that I've gone to shadow and they actually use that technique to uh, like occlusion training to actually help with some of the strength training that they're doing with their, their patients. Sure. Yeah. You can use it with like a patient if they have an injury Yeah, you, to that limb, you can start rebuilding that limb using much less weight. So you're not straining the connective tissue or the joint but you can start hypertrophy in the muscle and stimulating some growth in there without having to use the heavy weights that you would in normal training. Yeah, that makes complete sense. So you can use it like that. Uh, people are using it, are experimenting with it in, in sport training or recreational training, bodybuilding training, um, anywhere they would be interested in stimulating hypertrophy. Okay, yeah, that's awesome. So it's, we'll see where it goes. And, yeah. and I don't know what the ups and, upside and downside of it are gonna be. Right, for sure. O only time will tell, right? Let's go into, we talked about a number of different factors and variables that, or we mentioned factors and variables that can contribute to hypertrophy outside of just what their training regimen is. Uh, in your experience, what are some of the things that can contribute to whether or not they're able to train for hypertrophy and, and how successful they are at that? Okay. So when you're looking at training for hypertrophy, you're looking at two pieces of that. You're going to have the stimulus, which is the training. Right. And then you're going to have the ability to recover. Mm -hmm. Now, the ability to recover is what we're talking about at this point. Okay. And that's going to require that you're getting enough sleep for your body to recover. Okay. That you're meeting your nutritional needs, you know, your macronutrients and your and your micronutrients. Make sure you're getting adequate levels of those. Um, and again, that'll vary from person to person. But if you're paying attention to it and tracking, you can probably figure out about what your body needs over time. Um, supplementation plays a part in that. Creatine can be helpful for hypertrophying. Um, and then there'll also be the hormonal environment. Some people are going to have form more, more for favorable hormone levels to building muscle than others. Um, you can also exogenously add to, uh, hormones that yeah, will that'll definitely help. That will stimulate hypertrophy. Um, and then there's just some things that genetic predisposition to it that aren't totally understood and that... Uh, we don't really have much control over at this point, right? but that will be a significant factor. Again, you can take two people and train them the exact same way and get pretty different results. Okay. Just so our listeners have some stuff that's that's uh, somewhat applicable as well. When, in addition to the stuff that we've said, when we're looking, if, if you had someone who said, okay, I want to train for hypertrophy, what are some of the basic things that they can start out doing? Uh, and maybe even before we get into that, I'm sure there's a science behind like creating supersets and stuff like that can, and like compound sets and everything. Can you kind of talk about that and then talk about a, a good starting point that people can start with, or a good starting point where people can start to apply if they want to train for hypertrophy? Okay. Yeah. So training for hypertrophy, just like any other training for a purpose is you're going to need to define what your objective is, why you're doing it, mm -hmm. and then use that to help you formulate a, a plan to manage your training. Um, so you'll need to figure out roughly how many days a week you can realistically train, um, make sure that you're getting adequate sleep, adequate food, all the things that you have to have is just preliminaries. And then you'll lay out your workout structure. It's pretty typical in um, bodybuilding training to split the training by body parts or possibly even by movements. By movements, I mean like doing a push day, a pull day, a leg day, something like that. Um, by body part, you can split it out one body part at a time. You can split it out and, and pair up body parts. Um, you can do it a lot of different ways, but you want to pair, set that up so that based on the stimulus that you're doing the training, you're getting adequate recovery between training sessions. Probably optimal training is going to be between two and three times a week per body part, depending on intensity in the body part. A lot of bodybuilders get away with training body parts once a week, so they'll train it really, really hard and then let it have a week to recover. Okay. Um, you can manage it where you do three days a week where you train it from different angles or you train it at different intensities. 
Uh, you can do two days a week where you have a heavy day and a lighter day or, you know, one like Monday, maybe you do bench press and shoulder press for your upper body push. And then on Thursday you do close grip bench and weighted dips, you know, so you're training it at different angles and with slightly different movements. Okay. And then you can also just manipulate the intensity. Every workout and every movement doesn't need to be done at 100%. That's one of the biggest mistakes I see people make is when they start training, they come in and feel like they have to start off like a highlight reel right away. Right. Every Everything has to be, you know, heavy all the time. impressive and heavy all the time. Yeah. Well, if you're coming from not training and you introduce the stimulus of training, it's going from zero to adding any stimulus is going to get a response and your body's going to be more likely to be able to recover from a lower stimulus. So come in easy. Let's just start working a little bit and then push your intensity up. On the bigger movements, bench press, squats, things like that, it sets your body back as far as recovery a long ways anytime you push those movements to failure. Okay. So you're probably better off not quite pushing those to failure. Once in a while, maybe go to failure on them. But if you do it all the time, you're going to overtrain pretty quickly. Um, There's other movements you can get away with it more on, smaller movements. You know, if you're doing a curl on a machine, you can probably push that to failure pretty frequently and not have a big problem. Okay. It's very systemically taxing for a big movement to be pushed to failure. It's going to tax your nervous system pretty significantly, can stress uh, connective tissue, and it's also just going to be very fatiguing on large portions of your musculature. Okay. What are some of the ways that people can know that they're training too hard? That's a good question. Um, there, you know, you, you can read a list of the symptoms of overtraining, basically feeling fatigued, uh, lack of motivation, elevated heart rate. Um, there's, there are different uh, software programs you can get now that will tell you if your body is signaling action, that it sounds, it seems like it's overtrained or that it's ready for more training. Um, I think a lot of it as, is as you mature as an athlete and get more of a feel for your body and an understanding of how you should feel and, and how you feel when you're training well. Okay. You can kind of just feel it. Um, and then you want to avoid going into that state of being overtrained. You may intentionally overreach for short periods of time at a few times a year to peak, but you need to then allow yourself adequate recovery after that. And if you push overreach too much, you just end up not being able to recover and you just have a decreasing performance. Okay. So one thing, one thing I'll tell people is if you're working hard, and you're getting decreasing in performance, that, that's a sign of overtraining. You're overdoing it at that point. That, that makes that, complete that, sense. That's a sign of it too. And it's common. I mean, people want to train hard. Yeah. They want to push themselves. They want to, you know, do all the stuff that looks cool. But you got to progress into that over time, and you've got to work within your capacity. Okay. So it's, it's not about coming in and maxing every day. It's about stimulating or, or prodding your body along to get that adju- the adaptation. Yeah. Um, Bodybuilder Lee Haney used to say, stimulate, don't annihilate. I like that, yeah. Yeah, so you stimulate it and your body adapts and you get a favorable response. You annihilate it, you've kind of, you've in a sense, injured it. Right. And you're not going to get a favorable adaptation because it's just trying to survive and recover at that point and not having the resources to make a full positive adaptation. Yeah. So for, for people that are listening who may be just jumping into strength training, different things like that, I'm assuming there's a level of soreness that you should experience and where some amount is good, but if, if you're getting to the point where you can't move the next day, then you're probably yeah, maybe overdoing I mean, it or something like that. People have all different types of weird relationships with muscle True. soreness. Um, uh, it, there's not a one-to-one correlation or linear relationship between how sore you got and how much hypertrophy or strength you've stimulated. Okay, um, That's probably mainly just muscle damage that you've done. You really shouldn't experience extreme muscle soreness once you've got some training under your belt and mm-hmm. you're, you're, you've built up some training history. You'll still get sore, but it probably shouldn't be like that kind of soreness you can experience if you haven't, let's say you haven't squatted in a year and you go in and do a, a bunch of squats, you're going to have extreme soreness. You're not going to be able to you know, squat down or sit down. Um, you shouldn't be in that state very often. Yeah. And you probably don't need to get in that state in the first place. You just need to moderate how you're training when you first start back to it mm-hmm. because I'm not aware of any benefit to getting that sore, but it is causing, in one sense, an injury, and it's going to make it less likely that you're going to return the next time, and it's going to probably increase the likelihood of being injured and other negative effects from being pushed too hard. So, yeah, I wouldn't promote that as something that we're really 
chasing. Yeah, shooting um, for. You know, Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, you're going to be sore a little bit after you push hard. Right. But it's not to the extremes of what people get. And if you push that too far, you can end up with rhabdo where you've caused muscle damage and the muscles start breaking down and you start having kidney problems. Yeah, absolutely. Um, no, awesome. Thank you for that comment on that. Is there anything else you'd like to add with regards to uh, training for hypertrophy? Training for hypertrophy can basically, you can use that how you want to use it. It can be very fun. I, I enjoy training that way. Pump feels good. You know, it feels good to see your muscle puffed up. So it's, yeah. uh, it's enjoyable. It's, it's fun. Um, there's some reasons to do it. You know, if you're training as an athlete, a lot of them are just reasons like you either like the way you feel when you do it or you like the way you look. I think ultimately with training, one of the most important pieces is that you enjoy the experience of the training yeah. so that you continue doing it for a long term. So it's a sustainable thing. Um, maybe training for a specific sport for a specific goal may not feel that way all the time. But once you're outside of that realm of your life and you're training just as a lifestyle and because you want the health benefits and the psychological benefits and all the other benefits of it, it should be something that feels kind of good and that you enjoy and that you want to do. Yeah, absolutely. Is there anyone that shouldn't be training for hypertrophy? Um, I mean, I'm sure there's lots of people with different health situations yeah. that, that could it could be too taxing for or over stress. Um, there are also lots of health benefits to increasing your muscle mass. Um, improved metabolism, you're probably going to have less chance of falling if you have greater strength and greater muscle hypertrophy. Um, there's hormonal benefits. So it, it also blood sugar, you know, there's, there's going to be probably way more pros than cons, a lot more benefits to yeah. doing it. Um, again, that's not a general prescription that everyone should go do it, mm -hmm. but if they don't have a medical condition that precludes them from doing it, then yeah, pretty much everyone else should probably be doing it. You, you know, you want to have the effects of the increased bone density, the improved integrity of your connective tissue, and then all the benefits of having somewhat larger muscles to give you. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, for those of you who missed the last episode, August is the founder of the Iron Athlete Clinics, which is an educational based website and clinic where he goes and educates people on weightlifting. Uh, and he has a blog article that is called a practical guide to hypertrophy in addition to a few other articles uh, where he talks about hypertrophy training. So if you're interested in learning a little bit more, I'll go ahead and post those in the show notes. So you can go ahead and click on those. On our next episode, we're going to be discussing training for muscle endurance uh, and the different ways you can go about doing that and some of the factors that are related to improving muscle endurance. August, thank you once again for being on the show. Thank you, Dr. Matt. Hope you all learned something and we'll catch you on the next episode. Having issues with low energy and staying mentally sharp? Your hormones can play a role on how much energy and focus you have throughout the day. Our team at Ethos Integrative Medicine loves working with busy individuals who want to feel their absolute best and get the most out of life. Ask our team how you can get more information to learn about our unique approach to hormones so you can continue to take on the world.